I am not sure. Since it's going live, it says I'm live, and it looks like the right things are on the screen. So um, we're going to try to click over here and get this up on top and get this down and see whether or not we can get uh, one of these off, which is uh, maybe that one. Nope. Nate. Nope. Tom. Nope. This is, this is Tom having difficulty. Uh, this is, um, okay, so we're doing, uh, hmm, title should be on, and that should be off. So this is Misophony Treatment with Relaxation Training and Counter Conditioning by Tom Dozier and Nate Mitchell in all of our struggles and difficulties here. Uh, Nate will be join, uh, joining us soon. And um, there is our, is our uh, window for Nate, and here is our window for Tom. We're going to turn off the title. And uh, here we are talking about misophonia treatment with relaxation training and counter conditioning. Uh, I'm Tom Dozier. I have been working on uh, misophonia now for seven years. Let me just turn to my assistant here. Can you see if you can find me on the internet somewhere, Pam? My uh, assistant is Pam, and she is trying to see whether or not we really are alive, and uh, so that you can ask questions, and we will be able to uh, answer them. So, um, right now, and, uh, Nate has uh, a flat tire of all things that is being taken care of. He will be popping back in the window shortly. Uh, again, I'm Tom Dozier. I've been working on misophonia for seven years. I'm a behaviorist. I'm a behavior scientist. And so uh, with misophonia, we find it is a reflex behavior. Uh, much to my surprise, I wasn't expecting to find this. I was thinking it was a, uh, simply an emotion, an emotional issue. Let me bring up um, a little chain here that shows our misophonia response chain. And uh, with this, it, uh, it shows that, uh, that misophonia, that we start with the trigger, and I'll shrink that just a little bit more. We start with the trigger, uh, and then once, that, once you hear or see or perceive the trigger, that it causes a physical flinch. Uh, and that is a, a Pavlovian condition physical flinch. And then after the physical flinch, the combination of the sound and the flinch causes these extreme emotions. Now, you do not experience misophonia this, this way. What you generally experience is that there is a trigger, you have the extreme emotions, and then you have the stress response and the increased heart rate and sweating and muscle tension and then you're covering your ears or you're telling the person to shut up or you're leaving the room or you're attacking that all of those things can can occur and this physical flinch is sometimes very small and sometimes large with other people now from the work i was just talking with nate about the kind of the percentage of the people that respond to this treatment. For me, I was going to guess at 80%. He said maybe 75%. And the re there are a couple of reasons why some people do not respond to this treatment. One would be that uh, they have too many comorbid conditions. They ha may have anxiety and depression, PTSD. They may have housing insecurity, food insecurity, relationship insecurity. There's just a lot of turmoil in their lives. The other thing that I found in, in a very small number of people, uh, occasionally I'll have a person who has a physical flinch, they address the physical flinch, and the emotions do not die out. So here's, here's what we see occurring. Um, with, with this, this response chain, is that if we can delete this initial 
physical flinch, right? If, if that goes away, then what happens is that as it declines, the extreme emotions decline, the stress response declines, and it just continues to die out. And it's not that you, well, in some people, it dies out so much that they hear the sound and they think, oh, I used to not like that sound. Um, but it really can just die out. So uh, the, the basic, so let me just leave that there and go ahead and, uh, actually I'll go ahead and talk about this. The, the basic treatment that I use is muscle relaxation training called progressive muscle relaxation. Progressive muscle relaxation was developed in the like 1920s by, uh, now I don't remember, I can't say, uh, but it was developed as a treatment for anxiety or high blood pressure. So if you have anxiety, then this will also help you with the anxiety. And what I have been asking people to do is commit and actually give one hour of practice of effort of work on their misophonia a day. And the way that initially starts out is that I'm asking for an hour of progressive muscle relaxation training. Now this is not a concept. This is a muscle skill. So in a way, it's like becoming a concert pianist. The only way you can become a concert pian pianist is by practicing the piano and practicing and practicing and practicing. So for muscle relaxation skills, you need to do this enough that your brain will actually start to grow neuron connections together that do not exist right now. So right now, if you want to just do this as an experiment, try to relax your jaw. Just let the tension go out. You should be able to do this. You can just, just let it relax. And you will see that as you do that, that you can relax your jaw. Now, without tightening any muscles, try to locate the muscles in your lower back and relax them. And you'll probably find that you can't because you don't have the neuron connections to actually relax that muscle on demand. Now if I ask you to tense your lower back and roll your by lowering your hips forward, rolling your hips forward and arching your back a little bit, feeling that tension and that pressure in your back and release and just let it go. Now in that case, because you had it tight and you let it go, you were able to release that muscle. And as you do that and pay attention and, and the paying attention of the, of the muscle, of how the muscle feels when it's tight and how that muscle feels when it's relaxed is absolutely crucial to being able to develop the ability to relax on demand. So as I was saying about the muscle training, go to misophoniatreatment.com forward slash PMR, watch the video at the top that I put together about 10 minute video about muscle relaxation training, and then go down to the guided audios. And the first one is from Arizona State University. No, first one from Dartmouth College. It's 25 minutes long. Do that once a day. The second and third, which are virtually the same, except I've muted one sound when the lady goes shh. So either the second or the third audio is from Arizona State University, and it's about 15 minutes. And so do the Arizona State University two times a day and the Dartmouth College one time a day. And <clears throat> when you do that, you will start, 
you'll, you'll get a state of deep relaxation. And it doesn't matter if you're so anxious that you can't leave your other muscles relaxed. Just keep on going through the guided audio because the real power, the real power in this is you pay attention to the tight muscle. You're focusing on that muscle. You're noticing how that feels in that muscle and that body part. And then you're relaxing and you're focusing on the relaxation and you have to focus the whole time and if your mind wanders just pull it back but you focus on the difference between tension and relaxation and how that feels and by doing that and the, the guided audio helps you do that it, it walks you through that but by focusing on the difference that starts creating neuron connections so that you can go relax now we're good with our jaw we're good with our fists, we're okay with our shoulders, but beyond that, we do not relax muscles on demand. Um, one of the things that, that I use when I, when I work with people is I, I do an example, I say, okay, try this. So tighten your fist, count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Now relax, say the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, L, P, Q, S, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. And I say, okay, that was zero muscle training, right? That was zero benefit because when you were tight, you were counting, you were doing something else. And when you were relaxed, you were saying the alphabet, you were not focused on the muscles. You did not benefit at all. You have to keep your mind focused on those muscles and focused on the difference. Um, the, the training usually says, you know, uh, 7 to 10 seconds tight, 10 to 15 seconds relaxed, and we're, it takes 10 to 15 days or 10 to 15 exercises. And I don't know whether it's all in the days, it's all in the number of exercises, it's a combination because I don't know how fast your brain would respond by growing neuron fibers, but it has to actually grow neuron fibers to uh, give you the ability to give you the neuron connections to go relax and just relax or relax your chest muscles. I can't figure out how to relax my chest muscles. So uh, do this three times a day, one and spread it out as best you can, which is a total of one hour. And then after you've done the one hour per day, uh, then we go into the the process of uh, sequential relaxation where you say okay relax my fit right fist relax my left fist relax my right bicep and upper arm relax my left bicep and upper arm relax my shoulders relax my jaw and you just step through the whole body re sequentially relaxing the muscles and I ask the people to do that three times a day or more when they're totally away from triggers uh, and then I ask him to do what I call total instant relaxation. One person called this a rag doll. That the, um, you know, a rag doll has no muscle tension. They're just totally limp. And so on your command to yourself, just go relax and let all the tension flow out. Let your jaw relax, let your face relax, let your shoulders, your neck, every muscle relax. And as you breathe in, you stay relaxed as you breathe out. You let your relaxation go a little bit deeper. You breathe in, you stay relaxed, you breathe out. You let the relaxation go deeper, and then you're done. And you want to do that five times or more per day. This is, again, after you've done at least 15 of the muscle, of the guided audios. And you do that five times a day when you're not relaxed. And then you want to relax when you move into a situation where there may be triggers. You want to relax after a trigger and hold that relaxation and stay relaxed through this process. Uh, I also ask people to use good management. Do not endure misophonia distress. If you're a misophonia warrior and you're going to take the misophonia on head to head and you're going to endure it until it goes away, it won't. It gets worse. Uh, and then we use counter conditioning sessions and we'll get Nate 
talking a lot more about that. And uh, what I found is in two to three months with the people I work with, that's uh, somewhere between like five and eight sessions uh, of adults who are diligent in doing their homework. With children, it often takes more sessions and more reminders and more work. But we find a significant reduction in, in, in uh, misophonia. In fact, let's see if I have this here or somewhere way down to the end. Somewhere in here, I'm going to have to find it now. Um, I have a chart of, of how, there it is. So here is the chart that I have of, of eight consecutive adults, uh, and these all responded. Again, I'm saying that maybe 20 to 25 percent of the people, one person out of this time period, I referred to another treatment uh, because she had a a sexual sensation as her initial physical response, but we see 70% reduction uh, in the misophonia assessment questionnaire, uh, which went from about, what is it, about average of 79% uh, or so, which would be uh, about a 50 out of, on the, the, that score, uh, and uh, down to 20%, which would be like a 12. So like a 50 to a 12 rating drop for the misophonia assessment questionnaire. And the misophonia impact or impairment survey also had a 70% reduction. Uh, these people went from, uh, let's see, 40% out of, out of 50 is 20. So they went from a score of about 30 uh, down to a score of about 10 in, or eight, uh, in that, the same period of time. So this has been, been very effective and worked very well. So let's see, we don't have innate back yet, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that, that blank. Uh, let me tell you a couple of stories, and, and this is the one, let me go back and pop that back up there, and go back to this response chain. This, this is what people, typically with misophonia do not believe. I, I, many times I have heard, oh yes, I have misophonia, but I don't have that initial physical response. I don't have that initial physical reflex. And that is a very common understanding of people with misophonia. And I believe that's part of what's made misophonia uh, confusing to many of the researchers because Unless you're dealing with uh, a person up close and personal, or you're happen to dealing be dealing with one of these one person who was has a very clear physical reflex, this physical reflex is not talked about. It is so mild and so unimportant compared to the extreme emotions, compared to the anger, the rage, the disgust, uh, the anxiety, the sadness, the physical distress that's experienced, the desire to punch somebody in the face or choke them until their, the food and their teeth and everything comes flying out of their mouth. You know, it's the, the emotions of misophonia are so extreme that it dwarfs the experience of the initial physical reflex. And so, so most people do not notice it. In fact, I'll tell you a story of one of, one of the, and this is part of how I knew that there was this initial physical reflex. Uh, the first person I worked with uh, was doing an experimental counter conditioning treatment and she described her physical sensation as having a shovel run through her chest and out her back. And what we determined, but, but she had this strong physical uh, sensation but when we did the counter conditioning treatment, which was in this case, her was she was talking about very positive, happy memories when things were so wonderful and this great professional experience she had and all the accolades that she was getting from the people who were uh, coming through her, her architectural, her, this house that she had designed and that they had built. Um, and we would play, I'd play just small, small snippets of triggers and she would rate how strong is it, you know, is it a one, is it a two, is it a three? 
And she was doing a scale of one, one to five, so that she could indicate it by hand. But she'd say, "Oh, that's a that's a 1.6," you know, and and she didn't like the hand gesture. But we were doing this, and she noted at the end of the treatment that she had felt the physical sensation, but that she hadn't had any emotional reflexes. And uh, you know, the so the the response chain was a trigger, the physical reflex. And then nothing. Again, we were keeping it very weak. We were doing this under a very positive situation. And then the second person who really reported a physical reflex to me and uh, was very clear about it was this 10-year-old girl. And we were going to do this counter-conditioning treatment with her and her mom. And her mom was going to rub her back and relax her while I played the little bitty snippets of triggers. And so we had the, the little girl laid out on a massage table in, in my office here, and mom was rubbing her back and everything. Uh, and I played this little snippets of trigger, and we saw, you know, we, we saw the jerk. Now, before we had started, I had asked her about her physical reflex, and I said, do you have a, do you notice a physical reflex? And she says, no, I don't have a physical reflex. I just feel rage. And she was, you know, she knew I just just rage. And so after we did this counter conditioning treatment for about 15 minutes, again with very weak triggers, we said, I said, so did you feel anything physically? Because mom and I could see her. We both like were pointing to the shoulders and yeah, look at that. And she goes, Oh, I felt it in my arms and in my legs. We hadn't seen the leg ones, but she was feeling both of those. And I said, okay, so what emotions did you have? She said, oh, none. And again, it's like, okay, this physical reflex and this emotional reflex are not hard tied together. And so that's part of why we worked on that, to, to bring this down. So um, some of you, and by the way, Pam, are you able to see questions? No. Can you see a comment? No, Can you see? I'm, uh, I'm off too. Yeah, I need you voice. to. I need you to get back onto. Um, I know. I was a, a smaller screen. And get back, and we need to somehow see the chat. There's the the chat. So see if you can somehow bring that chat up. Okay. Uh, find find where to get that. So we're, we, we're, I'm trying to figure out how to see the chat so that um, we can answer your questions. Uh, so let me let me go for a moment here. I apologize. This this is a we're not pros at this uh, by any means. So again, I apologize. Live chat. I'm going to say participants, uh, and I'm looking for. The chat. So, would somebody say something? Would somebody type something in and let me see if I can can see this on my screen? Um, I would certainly appreciate that. Uh, so, I'm going to go go back to where I was. We'll come back to this in a minute. Um, so, the the um, some of you have an initial physical reflex that is going to be very clear. If you have it in your jaw, yeah. if you ha have it in your shoulders. Yeah, they're, they're hearing it. They're hearing it? And you, are you getting a question? Any questions? No so, questions, just comment. Okay, if you have any questions, please type them in because we want to address your questions. Um, so uh, one person who was my younger daughter uh, told me one time, we go, go see them every two months and they have little boys, and she said, Dad, after the boys have gone to bed, my uh, husband is eating cookies and chips, and I find myself getting so upset. I'm just getting annoyed, irritated, and angry, and I can't control it. So that's the onset of misophonia. And so I said, okay, Amy, you're, you're tensing up somewhere. If you can just relax, see if you can find out where it is and relax those muscles, whatever it is, uh, and if you can't tell where it is, just relax. I said, it'll make it better because tensing up and driving into the misophonia makes it worse. 
relaxing and have it like boom go through you and just stay relaxed that will help your misophonia get better so two months later uh, we had gone to visit again. She's in the kitchen by herself. I walked in and she said, oh, dad, it was my shoulders and it's gone. So about a, a month, about a year later, I asked her, because I wanted to use this in presentations and, and, and uh, about her misophonia, about her, her getting angry with her husband. She says, no, it's not a problem anymore, she said. But very rarely I'll find myself uh, maybe I'm stressed or tense or whatever, and I'm hearing him chewing. I'm starting to get a little irritated, and I go, oh, and she says, I relax, and it's just, it's gone. Um, yes? There's one that says they go straight to anger, bypassing any physical reflex. Okay, now, again, you go straight to anger because the physical reflex is not obvious to you. We did a... Um, a study that we're trying to get published where we hooked up people to uh, electromyography and there was going to be a known trigger the person hears the trigger 200 milliseconds boom there goes the muscles uh, and so part of the reason that shows that this is a that this is real is that when we treat it this way <laughs> that we have good results so if you feel like you just have instant anger, it may be that you have a very weak physical reflex, um, and therefore it's not it's not dominant. But relaxing, even if you don't have a physical reflex, learning to relax on demand uh, is a powerful positive. Uh, characteristic for you because if you notice even if you just feel like you just have rage that rage comes with a lot of tight muscles and oh, I'm so mad and, and when you're angry your body's very tense and so relaxing those muscles can help reduce the emotions also so um, what's that I was thinking about breathing. Yeah, and breathing, you know, pace breathing is good, but it's not near as, as, as important as relaxing your muscles. Now, that, that said, that comment came from my wife, whose initial physical reflex was to hold a breath. And so for her, she came in, uh, she's had misophonia, mild misophonia, long time, as long as we know. She's every now and then complained about me shuffling my feet and... Uh, clacky heels in Target, but it's, it's not clinically significant until her chickens, her, her pet, her wonderful pet chickens started uh, clucking outside her window very loudly and she came into my office saying, Tom, you got to do something about the chickens, they're driving me crazy. And the reason was is that she would hear them all clucking loudly, she would be concerned that the neighbors would be upset, she, her little lizard brain would hold her, lock her muscles down, and then, and then the anger is coming from that. So for her, because she was a, had a, a reflex of trying to hold her breath, scuba breathing, breathe in, breathe out. If you've ever done scuba, the number one rule is never hold your breath, y'all. Keep breathing. And again, it's, it's better if you'll breathe out a little slower than you breathe in because that activates your sympathetic nervous system parasympathetic nervous system and um, and then that helps you calm down but the breathing breaks that physical reflex if 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 holding your breath is your is your reflex if holding your breath is not your reflex or gasping in or gas or breathing out then it's much less important for the lady who felt the shovel go through her chest and out her back, what was happening is her, her windpipe was closing off and she was gasping for breath. So if you'll just pinch your nose, close your mouth, and do a quick breathe in, you'll feel it right there in the center. And that was what was happening to her automatically. Um, a story, another story of a, of a person who had misophonia. Now this is, you may say, oh, I'm going to, Tom, you can't, you know, your daughter didn't really have misophonia. Your wife didn't really have misophonia because she was not having this anguish and this distress and all of this problems from it. 
well, I'll give you another case. So this lady was um, disabled. She hadn't held a job in two years. She had moved home because her, her misophonia was so horrible. She um, spent 95% of her time alone or um, with headphones on to isolate her from triggers. And her misophonia assessment questionnaire, if I remember right, it was 92, uh, sorry, 62 out of 63 or 63 out of 63. I mean, she was maxed out on her severity rating. Two days after we met and talked about this physical reflex and how important the reflex is, um, she was out helping her and her mom went over to help a neighbor pull weeds from her from, from her flower bed. She really wanted to do this service project and kids were out playing on the street and no sooner did she get out there that, that the kids started screaming and instantly she goes to like a nine you know out of ten just extreme distress but she really wanted to stay there. Now she was very fortunate that she had a jaw reflex so that she could relax her jaw and she said as soon as I was able to start relaxing my distress level started coming down and I'm going to try to remember this I, I think I have the numbers so excuse me if I make a slight timer uh, number rating wrong but she said after about five minutes on a scale from zero to ten I was down to a five and I wasn't really experiencing distress anymore after 15 minutes I was down to maybe a one or a two when I heard the kids scream and having n virtually no reaction and after 20 minutes I was unaware of the kids screaming so yes so what do you do if you if you have misophonia and you have this expectation that you're going into a situation that it's going to be bad? That's anticipatory anxiety. Thank you for whoever asked that question. Um, so let me see if I can find the, the one I'm looking for that, this. Okay. Notice down on about halfway down the, the treatment it says relax right with three exclamation marks after it and you need to relax um, before you go into that situation you need to willfully intentionally let your muscles relax now you say but I can't relax it's too tense right that's because you haven't done enough training in muscle relaxation to become a muscle relaxation pro. So I want you to use my um, my saying in this anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you can learn to do it well. So you're gonna be lousy at this at first. Don't go into tough trigger situations. I apologize if I just triggered someone. My nose was itching. Um, you don't you don't go in to a tense situation like that without having your earbuds where you can have some background noise or having a plan of how you're going to escape you you really want to avoid this extreme misophonia distress so part of your treatment if you look down on the presentation slide there right after relax and the different three different ways of relaxing into the situation after a trigger and holding that relaxation whenever there are triggers is good management I want you to avoid misophonia distress and if you're using good management skills you will have ways of escaping this distress and therefore you need it will cause less anxiety if you learn that you can that you now have the ability to relax your muscles and the triggers are less severe you will have less anxiety and if 
your misophonia triggers are so extreme that you can't do that, then we want to do some counter conditioning. So by the way, relaxing your muscles and going into that situation is a form of counter conditioning uh, because you have the relax, relax muscles versus the pulsing muscles. But if you can be happy, if you can be having fun, if you can be doing something that fills your heart with joy and gladness, then hearing weak triggers, your lizard brain, let's see, I have my little, little uh, chart here where I show we've got the thinking brain up top, we've got the emotional brain in the middle, and we've got the lizard brain at the bottom, the autonomic nervous system there on the bottom. And that lizard brain, if, if you're being very happy, the emotional brain and the lizard brain will start to change because you have this very happy situation being painted over a weak trigger. And that's called counter conditioning. This is not what we would call exposure therapy, where we want you to hear the triggers until you habituate. People do not habituate to misophonia triggers. So um, you want to have something very positive. I had one woman who had her cell phone, and excuse me if scrolling through a cell phone triggers you, but she, um, she had her phone and she would scroll through looking at pictures of her dog. And her dog just filled her heart with joy. And she looked at pictures of her dog and she heard the little weak triggers and the trigger, the reflex, the severity of it just started dropping away. So this is a, a uh, this is a very powerful treatment. So even if you feel that you don't have a physical reflex, do the muscle training because being able to relax after a trigger rather than tensing after a trigger will reduce your anger much quicker and it will put you into a situation of, of bringing down that anger response. Um, any other questions coming in? No, but um, I think I think what you said about the earbuds yes. and um, an escape plan and realizing that people are not triggering you on purpose, right? Well, uh, could be could be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, good management is very important, uh, and if you have a child who, uh, or, or I have a student here listening and you're being triggered by kids at university or in the classroom or you know high school, elementary school, wherever, and you're being forced to stay there and endure that torture, your misophonia is getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And we find that any time um, you're having a repeating trigger and you're experiencing misophonia distress. So this goes to why I say good management is to avoid misophonia distress. Anytime you are experiencing misophonia distress, then you're in a situation where any repeating sight or sound can become a new trigger. That's bad. Secondly, your, your lizard brain is the most neurotic and insecure part of your body. It is always, it's never confident. It's always second guessing itself. So if, and your emotional brain will do the same kind of thing in learning reflexes. So it triggers you and the physical reflex goes, uh. And then for two seconds, two and a half seconds, the lizard brain is going, oh, did I do the right thing? Was that the right thing? I'm not sure if that's the right thing. Oh, oh, the muscle is tightening. Oh, good, I did the right thing. Next time, I will do it again. <clears throat> or it's, you know, trigger, uh, did I do the right thing? Did I do the right thing? Oh, my goodness, it's being much harder. Next time, I will hit that muscle harder. And we find that the physical reflex builds up, the emotional reflex builds up. So the more you endure misophonia distress, the stronger the wor your, your reflexes become, the worse your misophonia is. Um, now, that neurotic lizard brain, if it's like uh, trigger, uh, oh no, oh no, I pulsed that muscle, but now that muscle's relaxing. I did the wrong thing. Oh no. And 
fairly quickly that that brain will start to change its reaction. So I worked with them. I'm a parenting coach. Any of you have three-year-olds hitting the baby or chaos in your home, um, kids slurping around you, and they do it on purpose just to irritate you? I'm the guy for the parenting work. So I was working with this couple uh, whose four-year-old was whacking kids at, at preschool, and this is a multi-week process of changing the environment, changing the child, um, helping them build new behaviors. And toward the end, I, I always mention misophonia because misophonia is very common. Over 10% of adults in the United States have clinically significant misophonia based on uh, several surveys. And, and so this 40-year-old burly guy goes, oh yeah, that's me. I'm like, you're kidding. He goes, no, I had this friend as, in high, as a teenager who chewed so loud and I couldn't stand it. Drove me nuts. And, um, and so uh, we talked about his reflex, where it was, and he felt like it was in a, he, I clenched my fist and I clenched my jaw. He says, my kids chew around me on, around me on purpose because they know it irritates me and it drives me nuts. And so, but he was still eating with his family. And so I said, okay, we, we figured out it was his jaw. This was the anger and frustration, and this was the reflex in the jaw. I said, you need to just relax your jaw and keep it relaxed. Now, you can't chew and keep your jaw relaxed, so you need to eat before or after your family, but just be with them at dinner time and keep your jaw relaxed. Well, we'd had really good success on the, on the parent coaching with our four-year-old, and so I guess he believed me enough to try it. And so he let go, go away. We talked about five minutes, you know. And so he comes back four weeks later for their last visit. How's the four-year-old? Oh, doing great. How's your misophonia? He says, oh, it's gone. Now, it had been over 20 years that he had had misophonia. And it's, it's gone in less than four weeks. I said, well, how long did it take? I'm thinking a week, 10 days, you know. He says, well, at first, 30 minutes. I said, 30 minutes? What do you mean? He said, well, I could feel my jaw jerking, and after 30 minutes, it just stopped. And what happens with these reflexes, this is, this is well supported in the research on, research on Pavlovian conditioning, is that the reflex is here, and since it's not being strengthened or reinforced, that over time, over experience, not just avoiding hearing it, it comes down and it stops. Now, overnight, something called spontaneous recovery occurs, and that reflex grows back, but not to full strength. So the next night, it comes down, and then it grows back, but not as far. And after four or five days, it's just gone. And so these examples, these cases, is why we believe that the basic model that we show that this basic model is accurate because we have many, many cases where this, this applies and has proven uh, in treatment. Now, there is a small number of people who have a, a physical reflex that when it dies out, they still have a strong emotional response. And that's maybe five to 10% of the people that I would, would, would work with. And on those cases, we then refer them to sequent repatterning hypnotherapy. Uh, because it, sequent repatterning hypnotherapy is a special misophonia treatment that was developed for misophonia that addresses primarily the emotional response. Uh, and again, we have those people um, who have situations where we can't actually implement this. Um, it's tough in younger children, uh, teenagers, because of the, the time of doing the exercises. So did we have a question? Yes. <clears throat> Does this stuff work for visual triggers? And what about when you see a visual trigger and you hold it in your mind? How do you get it out of your mind? Okay, those are good questions. So the answer here is yes, this basic treatment works for visual triggers. So when we did the, the muscle uh, t measurement, electrical muscle uh, measurement as to how quickly it occurs after a 
auditory trigger, that was about 200 milliseconds, and it varies a little bit. Um, then after the person had a known visual trigger, the, the muscles tightened after about 350 milliseconds. So I think if the person had to actually see the trigger a little bit and experience it, it's not as, as fast as the, as the auditory system. Um, the, the systems may be as fast, but the, the trigger, to get enough of a trigger to be a trigger, took a little bit longer with the visual trigger. And so, yes, visual triggers will respond exactly the same way as the, um, as the uh, auditory triggers in dying out. Now, the question was, how do you get this out of your mind? And that, that actually is very real for everyone. And the, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, one of the ways you get it out of your mind, it's gonna maybe be different for every person, uh, is that once you experience the smaller trigger, right? Once you experience that, then it's not as hard to get out of your mind as the full as the full size trigger. And then if you experience that, then it's not as hard. And so if you do the relaxation and bringing it down, that as you bring it down, you will not have a problem of getting it out of your mind because it's not the horrible thing that it is today. And so that's, that's a real benefit of having this way of relaxing. The other thing just I would say about getting it out of your mind is you can't not do something. If you said, okay, I'm not gonna think about that site, I'm not gonna think about their face, I'm not gonna think about, well, you're thinking about it. So what you wanna do is consume yourself in something else. Consume yourself in the nature sounds around you, the way your toes feel as they press down on your feet as you're walking, the way um, you know you have something in your hand that you rub your fingers together. I feel the sensation of my fingers. I'm thinking about describing, oh, this object here, it's my cell phone and it's black and it's about three by six and it's got a rubber case on it. And the more I'm thinking about this item, the less I'm thinking about triggers. And the, hard, the, more, the harder it is for that thought to come, become intrusive into my mind. So focusing your attention away from the triggers is, is a way of doing that. So can we have some more questions? So, um, so this isn't like exposure therapy or anything. And even if you don't have a, if you don't feel that you have a physical reflex, you really are somewhere. So, so that's a good question. So there's two questions in that. One is, this is not exposure therapy. And the answer is, this is counter conditioning. We're not asking, in fact, usually I go two, three, four weeks before I would start doing any planned uh, hearing triggers, uh, natural triggers. But once, once a person has the ability to relax, relax into those situations, and to uh, experience a reduced level of misophonia distress and of triggering, then that's a training event. So every trigger that you naturally hear is a lizard brain learning event. And so if you relax into those situations, you're just, what we're working on here is a relaxation skill that allows you to experience what you're naturally experiencing in a much more uh, painless way. And so that's, that's one thing. The second thing is that traditional exposure therapy that, that does not work, that makes misophonia worse, is trying to get habituation. Now habituation is where your brain stops responding to a trigger, uh, to, to, sorry, to a stimulus. So how does the pig farmer live with the stinky pigs and all the, the horrible smell? Well, the answer is that when your brain sees a steady stimulus, like the, the smell of the, of the pig farm, then the brain stops responding. 
it's really looking for differences in smell. And so when you have a steady state trigger, you habituate to it, a stimulus, like, like, a, like an odor. When you have a phobia and you put the spider up on, the picture of the spider on the wall, and you feel the, the kind of the heebie-jeebies, the anxiety, the fear, that with time, because that stimulus isn't moving and it, it's not threatening to you, you can relax and calm down, and that's habituation. But the problem with the trigger is that a trigger is a jolt to your body. Like each trigger is a new event, each sound. And so it's like this, here's my rubber band here. So it's like sniff, 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 and it doesn't habituate. But by relaxing into those situations, you're actually counter conditioning that mesophonic response, both the physical and the emotional responses, and the counter conditioning brings it, brings it down. The other thing in terms of counter conditioning that we haven't really discussed is with smaller children who can have fun, um, that the triggers, you do a, a trigger tickle, trigger wrestle, and that the child is having fun with the game, with the activity, and now you're pairing that little, a little trigger with a lot of fun, and the, the negative response goes away, the misophonic goes, response goes away. So did I answer the question? I think so. Okay, other questions. Please type in your questions. I'd love to, uh, to hear them. I'll talk a little bit about what I do, uh, who I am. I'm a, a behavior analyst. I, I am a board-certified behavior analyst, but I have to disclaim my board certification because this work is on respondent behavior and I can't do direct observation. So I am a behavior scientist, a behaviorist, and I, and in California, that is not a licensed um, occupation. There's no license available in California, which actually makes it kind of nice because I can, I'm not restricted by uh, state licensing rules uh, for working out of state by, by video chat. So I work with people by video chat uh, literally all over the world. And uh, we, we meet, we talk about the basics of misophonia, we talk about uh, their applications, try to help them figure out where their physical response is. And many times I have people who don't have a physical response and as soon as we, we start having them do some exercises on their own, uh, or paying attention to the small triggers, they'll, they'll find it, they'll, they'll find their physical response. Um, and so then we meet every, every week, two, three weeks, it just depends on the person's uh, desire to have the support. Uh, in, in adults who are stable and competent, we might meet the first week and then we would meet you know, seven days later, they made a commitment to do their muscle relaxation training three, three times a day, an hour's worth a day, and meet uh, again the next week, uh, you know, seven days later, talk about the experience, help them learn to do the sequential relaxation and the total instant relaxation or the ragdoll. And then they have some more exercises to do. And generally talk about some of the things that went well that week. And generally people will say, oh yeah, well I had this situation and I was relaxing and it wasn't as bad as usual. And so they're already noticing some positive benefit. And then maybe every two weeks after that, if a person wants more support, then we meet every week. And, um, and we just watch for the change, watch for the improvement. Again, in, in one individual, which is only you know one out of, of like 10, um, he had a reduction in his physical response, but his emotions were still really high. So then we shifted over to have him do the secret repatterning hypnotherapy with Chris Pearson or someone that Chris has trained. Uh, but that's, that's generally what we do. Um, so if you're interested, send an email to tom at misophoniatreatment.com or any other email that you might have for me. Um, we really, you know, have a, a treatment here that, that's very effective. Uh, and so the, we're trying to 
dispel the myth that there is no treatment for misophonia. We are trying to train other therapists. I am not trying to be exclusive or to brand this in any way. Uh, we have a training program. If you have a therapist that you like, have them go to misophonia.org forward slash training. And we have a program we call Comprehensive Misophonia Training for Clinicians, where we will teach them all of these things and, and how to cases, how to, how to implement uh, misophonia treatment in their own practice. You know, talking about exposure, <clears throat> the, and, and there are places, there, important people who recommend this incorrectly, they recommend treating misophonia like OCD with exposure and response prevention, ERP it's called. And the problem with ERP, if you look up here at the response chain, uh, what they're going to do is you're going to hear a trigger or see a trigger, and then you're going to try to not have any outward behaviors, right? So you're going to try to stay there and just, just be there. And essentially, if you look at this response chain, you're going to have the trigger, and then they're going to measure the, the last box, box, the coping behaviors, the fight or flight, uh, or the doing something, acting out to stop the trigger, and they're missing the core. They're missing the core of misophonia. So exposure and response prevention is something you should run from. Uh, it is. It does not work. Uh, if if you were, and, and there are cases where it has worked, where the person has done the ERP, but they've been very good at relaxing, and so essentially they've been doing. Um, the person was so good at relaxing, they didn't need the muscle training, and, and they were working on the misophonia as that initial physical reflex. So it does happen in some cases. It's published, and uh, there are very prestigious training groups that will tell you, oh, misophonia, treat it like OCD, use the ERP. But no, that's an exposure therapy that is generally harmful to the individuals. In fact, that's how I'm, I'm really sad that, that Nate Mitchell has not been able to join us, um, that uh, he was just pulled away as we were getting started. But that's how he found me is because he went to a seminar that was for OCD. He's an OCD expert, and he went to a seminar for OCD, and at the seminar they said, oh, use, you know, use exposure and response prevention for misophonia. And he tried it, and it didn't work, so he went out studying the research. Um, either the people said, no way, I'm not coming back, or it didn't get better. And so he could see people jerking and jumping in, in when they were being triggered. And he went out and he looked in the research, and then he found me in the Misophonia Institute. I do want to say that if you are anywhere near uh, Louisville, Kentucky, that this would be a great place to go to go see Dr. Nate Mitchell. So if you if you'll Google uh, Nate Mitchell psychologist uh, Louisville, he'll show up. Or go to misophoniatreatment.com uh, to our treatment provide treatment provider page and he's on that. And if you're if you're in that area, that would just be he's a really great guy to work with because he can get you face to face laughing uh, about something and then have the very extremely weak, again, this is not, not hard, not painful. This is for misophonia wimps, but it can get you laughing and working. One of the things that, that he and I have talked about is whether or not uh, he could do an intensive treatment. How much you know, progress could, he, could you make if you went to Louisville for a week and, and worked with him you know, intensively, and then went home to follow up and, and keep going and maybe come back, you know, at a, at a later time for follow-up. But that would be a very, um, very viable treatment, most likely. We'd like to try it, but we haven't been able to. Um, anyway, Pam Dozier, do we have any other questions here? Uh, no questions, but okay. uh, let them know how they can get in touch with you. Oh, you I want. guess... So Personally. you can get in touch with me by um, contacting Tom Dozier at 
misophoniatreatment.com. Tom Dozier, uh, sorry, Tom at misophoniatreatment.com or T. Dozier at misophoniainstitute.org or president at misophoniainstitute.org or if you'll Google Tom Dozier misophonia, my, my email will come up. So send me an email and I'll send you the forms and, uh, and information. Uh, but especially, especially go to your treatment, your therapist, your uh, psychologist, your counselors, and encourage them to do the misophonia training. That really what we want to have, what I would love to have, is two, five, ten trained professionals in every state of the United States and every English-speaking country. Uh, that's our goal, is to train people at Misophonia Institute. And that's our professional awareness uh, initiative uh, that we started with uh, going to the American Psychiatric Association meeting, the American Psychological Association meeting, and we just made appointment or registration reservation today to go to the American Psychological Association meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. this August. So anyway, contact me. Uh, call me if you want to, 925-322-5100 if I'm available. I'll pick up the phone, and it's a, it's a home office. And if I'm here and available, any time of day is fine, and it won't wake anybody up, so you can call me anytime. Okay, anything else, Pam, that you can think of? No. I, I appreciate having Pam here and her help with that, and I'm just uh, sad that uh, Dr. Mitchell, who was there and was just pulled away uh, because of... Uh, of an emergency. So uh, maybe we'll try to do this again and have Dr. Mitchell do most of the talking. So he's a wonderful man and he's a, he's a great professional. So thank you very uh, much. Oh, we have something here? One little thing. Are there links to the relaxation techniques that you first mentioned? Okay. Go the link to the relaxation technique. Let me see if I can pull this back up and get it on the screen. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Right here. And the first line, treatment. See misophoniatreatment.com forward slash PMR. And uh, that, that has a, a video, a 10 minute video about PMR. And think of it as, again, it's practice. It's practice. It's not a concept. You have to do it and do it a lot. Is this a study you're doing or is this a, a treatment thing? I have a person that. Yeah would like to be part of it. Well, th right now, we're not conducting any clinical trials, any formal treatment. We're just working, Dr. Mitchell and I are just working with individuals because it works. So and and so um, we're available, unfortunately, often with a, with a treat, with a, uh, you know, a treatment trial, then it's paid for by some you know, extra, extra source, but uh, we we are just providing treatment now. That that okay. answer our question, Pam. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate Pam being here in the sidelines, reading the questions and such, and I hope this has been beneficial. And uh, again, I apologize for the technical problems, and I know Nate apologizes for the emergency that pulled him away. So thank you very much, and we will now close, and I wish you well with your misophonia. There's a line from Galaxy Quest, which is a funny movie with a lousy trailer, but uh, I love the movie, and uh, Captain Taggart says, never give up, never surrender, and we've learned so much about misophonia in just the last seven years, and I'm sure we will learn much more in the next few years about treatment and, and what really works and getting trained professionals in your area. So uh, very good. Thank you very much, everyone, and I got to go. Bye-bye.